Thank you, Ed, Lisa, singing and Alex for the prayer. We appreciate so much your presence this morning. Definitely, it's a beautiful, sunshiny morning and uh, good frost on the ground. And um, just thankful that uh, that we're able to be here this this morning. Uh, this past Friday, I had the the honor of actually going to McMinnville and doing a, a funeral for a good friend of mine's mom, and um, actually two good friends of mine. But um, their mom had passed away, and, and she was a friend as well. Um, but on the way home, they kept talking about all these storms that were coming in. And, and they were actually, some of the people, uh, the, the weather people were saying, you know, this is different than other times. you got to watch tonight. It's going to be very dangerous. It's going to, you know, you need to pay attention. Make sure your phones are charged. you got your weather radio on. And they just kept on making a big deal about it, but... You know, Friday was is kind of a weird feeling anyway. You know, with the, the temp and the way the wind was blowing, all this different stuff. So anyway, Friday night, um, I wasn't paying attention. I was wore out. And Kim, she found some guy on YouTube that he had all the radars pulled up, and and he was talking about oh the big the big one just went through Mayfield, Kentucky. And I'm thinking, why why the news covering this? There's nothing. I mean. You got Jimmy Kimmel on or whoever, whatever the late night guy is. You know, the weather's going on. Somebody cover this. Well, nothing was covered. And then the more you started seeing the pictures that were coming in and the things that had happened and the number of people that had died. Devastating. Y'all, that shows me how fragile our world is. It's easy to think every day that I'm going to get up, it's going to be the same today as it was yesterday, but it's not. It, there's a potential that it won't be. And, and you think about how, all the people that had went to bed Friday night in Mayfield, Kentucky, some of them didn't wake up. Their lives are gone. And it can happen like that. And that's what, you know, I think God teaches us that so many times in Scripture. That you realize that your life is a very fragile thing. But it's so easy for us to just get used to, well, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow, and I know what I'm going to do the next day, and I know what I'm going to do the following day. No, you don't. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. Because really and truly, tomorrow never comes, does it? You know, James made a statement in James chapter 4, and verse 13. He says, Go to now you that say today or tomorrow, I will enter into such a city, and I will continue there a year, and I will buy and sell and get gain." Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanisheth away. When I think of a vapor, you know, the other morning it was very foggy. And just in a matter of a little while, it was gone. I think of a tea kettle that's sitting on a stove and it's, you know, the steam's coming out. And, it, and right there at the, at the spout, it is really apparent what's coming out of there. But then a very short distance away, there's no steam. Our lives are like that. Our lives are so short. And we're only here for a brief period of time. I did two funerals last week. I don't want to do two this week. But the two I did was both ladies and both of them were in their 70s. Well, the Bible says that the days of our year shall be three score and ten or 70 years. And if by reason of strength they shall be 80 years. Well, that you know, that's good. But there's no guarantee that old Johnny boy here is going to live to be 70. There's no guarantee that you are. Unless you're already past 70. But I mean, there's no guarantee that really that we're going to have another tomorrow. Turn your Bibles, if you would, this morning. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This passage in 2 Peter, he talks about how fragile life is. And, and, and how, how things can change in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, there, there, of course there's a big thing under discussion here. And that what's under discussion is the second coming of Christ. So as Peter begins this in verse number 3 of 2 Peter 3, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come the last day scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So there's going to come a point in time, which it's already come, that people are going to be mocking the name of Jesus. 
People are going to be laughing about Jesus and about God, and they're going to say, you know, you keep talking about him, he's going to have a second coming. Where's he at? It's been the same way today as it was yesterday and a hundred years before. But notice what Paul, um, I'm sorry, Peter says. Notice what he says in verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant. You ever know anybody that's willingly ignorant? They just don't want to know the truth. He says, they're willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. They know about the flood. They know about Noah. They know about what took place in, in, in his time. They know at the beginning of the world, in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, they know that. But it says they're willingly ignorant of it. In verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So God is, is, is reserving, He's reserving all this, this fire for the end of the world. But there's coming a time that that's going to happen. And, and people, again, people will say, ah, that's never going to happen. He's not ever going to come back. Yes, He is. If you go to Acts chapter 1 and you, and you look at, uh, here he is standing after his resurrection. He had been with his apostles for about 40 days. He ascends back to the Father. And as he ascends back, the angels say to the apostles standing there, Hey, why are you marveling at this? As you see him leave, so shall, show shall, so shall you see him come again. It, he's going to come back the same way. You're going to see him. So in, in this passage here in 2 Peter 3, Peter's warning them, listen, don't be willingly ignorant of the truth. Don't, don't buy into the fact that some of these people are saying that Jesus will never come back. He's not, not going to come back to this earth. And by the way, there are a lot of those people that said that Jesus wasn't who he said he was and that he was nothing more than a man and that his the disciples had stolen the body uh, out of the tomb. So don't worry about any of that stuff. But then he goes into this, which is a passage that many of us have heard all of our lives, talking about the second coming. But in verse 8 he says, But, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What does that teach us? That time means nothing to God. Time doesn't mean anything to Him. If you've always been and will always be, what, what does five minutes mean? What does ten minutes mean? You know, we're, we're used to time. I mean, our whole worlds are revolving around time. And I think it's getting worse. I mean, every, you know, we all got appointments, we got places to be, we got to be at work on time, we got to be here on time, we got ball games, we got all kinds of things happening. To God, time doesn't matter. What matters to God is not really yesterday, and it's not really tomorrow. What matters to God? which what should matter to us is now, the present, what's happening right now. To God, time means nothing. So one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, it doesn't matter. Verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Alright, so time really doesn't matter to God, but what's really important to God is that you remember His promise. God has made promises. One of the promises He made is, is that His Son is going to return. Through His angels there in Acts chapter 1, He said He's going to return. But here's the thing. God is long-suffering. Long-suffering. That means patient, right? That's what we understand it. It's patient. He's not willing that anybody perish. Now, are we talking about a physical perishing here or are we talking about spiritual? We're talking spiritual. Physical perishing is not what he's talking about here. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants men, women, boys or whoever, He wants us to repent of what we've done that's wrong. He doesn't want us to do that to shame us. He wants us to do that so we can come to know His Son and Him. That's what His whole point is. 
He wants us to be able to experience the forgiveness of sins, having our sins totally washed away. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Acts chapter 2, where the first gospel sermon is preached. What happens? Well, Peter and the other apostles preach, right? They preach about Jesus and about what uh, these people had done to him, and the people that were there, they realized that they had put to death the Son of God. And they were pricked in their hearts and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. Okay, come back to here, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God wants everybody to repent. You know, God wants us to, to, to be willing to submit to His will. That's what it's about. He wants us to be willing to give over our hearts to Him. He wants us to make that transition. And I'll be up front with you, that's not an easy thing to do sometimes. It's hard. But that's where you grow. That's where you mature spiritually. You give more, you give it over to God. Let Him have it. He's not slack concerning His promise. He's definitely not willing that any should perish, but that everybody come to repentance. Why, why wouldn't God want everybody to be saved? You think He does? I think He does. Why would He? I mean, He sent His Son. His Son paid the price on the cross of Calvary for everybody. So God wants everybody to take advantage of that. To have their sins washed away through the blood of His precious Son that died on the cross. So God wants that for everyone. And He wants everyone to, to repent and become obedient to Him. Now look at verse number 10. This is where He says, and this is talking about the end of the time. End of time. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and the works of therein shall be burned up. There's coming a day when that's going to happen. You may or may not be living when it happens. But I promise you this, you're going to know. It. You're going to know. It. When that day comes, when, when the heavens and the earth and the elements and everything is totally gone, you're going to know it. Revelation 1 and verse number 7 says, When Jesus returns and every eye will see him, that includes your eye. You're going to see him. Everybody will see. But there is coming that day <clears throat> when He shall return and everybody is going to know it. But everything that we've ever known is going to be gone. All the physical things are gone. Now I want you to think about this and, and, and this is kind of what brought this lesson. I thought about it. Looking at the pictures of Mayfield, Kentucky and looking at the pictures of other places around you pull up those neighborhoods. These are homes that people have, have worked hard to build. They are homes and, and places that people have worked diligently taking care of. No matter how many times this past summer they mowed their yard and, and made everything look pretty and, and everything's just great. But it's all a material nature stuff. Every bit of it. How long did it stand? In a matter of a moment. When that tornado hit, that stuff was devastated. Why do we put trust in things of a physical nature if, if they can't even withstand wind? <coughs> but we do it. We all do it. But don't put the majority of your trust in stuff of this world. That's the whole point of 2 Peter 3. Because this world is going to be gone. I'm a very sentimental person. Kim, Kim can attest to that. I keep stuff that's just weird. But it's stuff that reminds me of my grandparents, my parents, so on. But I realize, y'all, that that stuff is going to be gone one day. Probably when I die, it's all going to, to the dump. They're going to bury it down there. And, and Kim's going to be grinning me or dear. It's all gone. Don't have to worry about it anymore. But you know... I realize that I shouldn't place a lot of hope. And I shouldn't place a lot of trust in that old stuff. We were taking, we were rotating tires yesterday on boys' vehicles, and they got this new little impact gun, which is great. 
except <clears throat> when they, they was get taking the lug nuts off, it'd get hung in the socket. Well, we had to take and beat it out, you know. I pulled out an old socket that we probably had in, uh, in, in the Clayton family for 40 years, and which it worked pretty good, and I was bragging about it, you know, well, guess what? Love that got stuck in it, <laughs> so I had to beat it out too. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I've got that I really love, that I, that I cherish. But y'all, I realize that that's not where my faith and my hope needs to be. Where my faith and hope needs to be is in the blood of Jesus Christ and in His Father, who is also my Father. Everything is going to be gone. Everything is going to be devastated. And, and you, okay, I'll go back to verse 3 where it talks about scoffers, people making fun, laughing, oh, well, this is, this is never going to happen. Okay, if, if they would be honest with themselves, look at what happened in Kentucky and, and what's happened around here before. Look what happened at Waverly this past year, this, this past summer, with the flood. Things can change so quickly and can be just taken away. Verse number 11 says these words, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Everything of a physical nature that you know of is going to be gone. I don't care what it is. You name it, it's gone. If it's physical, it's gone. This building that we're sitting in that has so many memories and so many precious memories for so many of us is going to be gone. Anything physical, that includes your physical body. Because see, when this happens here, when this second coming happens, our flesh and blood has got to go. So we're going to have a, um, spiritual bodies. Now what's that going to look like? I don't really know. But you know what? It don't matter <laughs> what it looks like. What's important is who I belong to at that point, right? That's what's important. So seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, going back to verse 11 here, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? All these physical things of life that we know are going to be gone. What's going to matter? What kind of person was you for the way that you lived and your godliness? That's what's important. That's why we need to make sure that what we're doing day in and day out is being in obedience to God and is following Him, is putting Him first and, and making Him the what's most important to us in our life. <coughs> And it's not always easy to do. I'm not saying it is. But Jesus never did say, hey, this is an easy road. Y'all come right on. No, He said, this is a straight and narrow way. It's hard. But it's worth every ounce of effort you ever put in to following God. All these things that we know is going to be dissolved, are going to be dissolved, every one of them. If we understand that as Christians, why do we waste so much time on things that don't even matter. And I always say, I'm guilty. I am guilty. I spent a couple of hours yesterday blowing leaves that didn't even matter. You know, I talked about more in the yard. That's kind of a waste of time. Blowing the leaves yesterday. Why? When I enjoyed it, I looked like a, a robber with my full face walking on and, and stuff, but what's it matter? There's things in life that are important. There's things that are not that important. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and God is looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. He wants us to be inside of His Son, Jesus. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given him, hath written unto you. Why is the long-suffering of God salvation? Because it's given people an opportunity. It's given people time to get their lives ready, get their lives right, to meet God. 
In verse 16, he says, As also in all his epistles, talking about Paul's, speaking to them of these things in which some things hard to be understood, which they are unlearned and unstable, rest as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. It's possible to take the scriptures of the Word of God and twist them to make them mean what you want them to mean, and that will actually cause you destruction. So there's definitely a warning against that. You take every scripture, you take all the scripture, you read and study it, and you learn from all scripture. Don't twist them to your own destruction. And he goes on in verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. <clears throat> Even though you're maybe today you're standing in the presence of God, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, don't ever get to the point to think that you can't fall. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. Never get to the point that you feel like you deserve the blessings of God. Never get to the point that you feel like you deserve the forgiveness of your sins. You don't deserve any of that. I don't care how good you've been. You don't deserve it. Because if you want to start analyzing how good you've been, don't put it up against everybody else. Put it up against the, 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 the example of Jesus. How do you stack up then? None of us stack up well against the example of Jesus. Not when you begin to compare. We all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches us that. The Bible tells us that, that we have all sinned and fallen short. That's why it's so important that we bow down and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and we become obedient to His work. And never get to the point that I'm thinking, well, I've got this made. I, this is easy. I've got it. If you think it's easy, something's going on. Something's a problem. There's a problem somewhere. And as he warns here to these people who, you know, he's, he's warning those at the beginning of the chapter about those who are scoffing and laughing and making fun of Jesus. But y'all, he's not talking to those people here at the end. He's talking to the Christians. He's talking to the people who are steadfast, who at some at points in their life have been steadfast and he's saying you better be on guard you need to watch what you're doing you therefore beloved seeing you know these things before beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness do not fall from being faithful to God and then last of all a verse that we use a lot <coughs> verse 18 but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be both glory now and forever. Amen. What's happened in the last couple of days really just reminds us, hopefully, that this world is so temporary. It's so fragile. Life is fragile. You can take the biggest, toughest, meanest guy ever. I mean, just tough. At some point, he's not going to be that tough anymore. At some point, his life is going to be taken away. It's appointed that a man wants to die. We understand that. But here's the kicker on that to me, y'all. It's appointed that a man wants to die. That means you're going to be separated, your spirit from your body. But you're not appointed to die twice. If you get ready to meet Jesus, if you get ready in your life to, to, to be follower of His, you don't have to die a second time. Peter here, he is warning about the destruction of the world. He's warning about the second coming of Jesus. And he's saying it's going to happen. I promise it's going to happen. Well, y'all, it's been almost 2,000 years since he wrote those words. But I can tell you, I assure you, it's going to happen. When, I don't know. I know there's people today that are looking at the signs of the times and saying, oh, it's about to happen quickly. I don't know. But I do know this. It's going to happen. And I also know this, that if it, if it happens today and I'm ready, that's great. If it happens 10 years from now and I'm ready, that's great. <clears throat> but if it happens today and I'm not ready, it's not great. God gives us an opportunity to become obedient to Him and just remain obedient to Him. And so if you're here this morning you're not a Christian, we encourage you to, to become a New Testament Christian today by believing in Jesus with all your heart, by being willing to repent of your sins, 
Confess your faith in Christ that He is the Son of God and then be baptized for the remission of your sins. Get ready to meet Jesus because it's coming. One day it's coming. I don't know when, but it's coming. Let me say to those of you who are already New Testament Christians, are you remaining steadfast? Or are you drifting away with the errors of the world? That's what he's talking about there in verse 17. You need to make sure that you're steadfast, that you're ready. So if you wandered away from the fold, if you've gone back to the world, you need to come home and repent of those sins as well. And ask God to forgive you and be restored back to the fold. Above all, we need to be ready. Always be ready for the second coming of Christ. You need to come this morning. Please come as we stand and see. <coughs>